The Outer Wilds is a space-themed action-adventure game set in the distant future that came out in 2019 for Windows, Xbox One, and the PS4. The Outer Worlds is a space-themed action-adventure game set in the distant future that came out in 2019 for Windows, Xbox One, and the PS4. Oh dear. Given the obvious problem here, did sales of one of these games get affected? Did everyone go out and buy The Outer Worlds, a first-person shooter with actual human beings instead of The Outer Wilds, a game that actually isn't similar at all? No! Who in their right mind would accidentally buy the wrong game and do nothing about about it. Oh boy, I can't wait to sit down with the family and watch the critically acclaimed masterpiece, After Earth. Oh, would you look at that? I've put on Saw 2 again. Oh well, too late now. Shield your eyes, children. The Outer Wilds, which is the game I'm reviewing, is a game about exploring a solar system filled with varied and interesting planets. Now you know me, I love space exploration. Something about drifting up into the majesty of space, discovering an unknown planet on the horizon, setting course then accidentally breaking too late and colliding with it at the speed of sound. Now because all my videos are sponsored, I need to be seen spending a sizable sum of money on things like set design. So, ow! Here we are inside this place and or thing. I didn't know where we'd be filming, so I haven't updated the script yet. Yeah, I put in the effort, not like this guy. Oh, this video is sponsored by Honey, so I'm gonna eat two bottles of honey. Oh, I hope your accountant can work out how to expense such steep overheads. Now, this video is gonna spoil the entire game. So if you haven't done so already, go and play it now. The real gamers are gonna stay up and chat. You start the Outer Wilds as a Hearthian, a four-eyed being from the planet Timber Hearth. Your species has recently developed space travel and is enjoying its many benefits. <laughs> Today is launch day, so you say goodbye to all of your friends, encounter a strange alien statue that gives you the eye, three of them to be exact, and you take off just in time to see your sun go supernova and your whole solar system goes the way of my career after those photos got out. You wake up back where you started and learn that time is repeating itself. Every 22 minutes, your sun goes but you wake up seemingly before this all happened and are the only one that seems to know it happened at all. And so starts your adventure where you travel around your solar system learning how to stop whatever is causing your sun to explode and thus saving all of your friends in the process. So as you can imagine, as an opening of a game goes, this is all pretty enthralling. The true genius in this opening for me though is the design of the Hearthians themselves. <laughs> See, so you can warn them of this impending threat to all known life in the solar system and they just say, Oh yeah, I heard our son could do that. The Hearthians simply don't give a fuck. Consequently, all their spaceships are effectively death traps. At one point, someone tells you that the autopilots on the ships don't have any avoidance systems, but he's so nonchalant about it. You just think, oh well, I'll stick it on and go sort out the ship computer. A few moments later. There we have it, another job well done. Oh no, not again! What is it with these games and me colliding with stars? The importance of all this though is that the Hearthians help set up the tone of this game as the jaunty space adventure it is. See, the unending vacuum of space can be a little scary, but this opening assures us everything will be kept both fun and light. <laughs> Now what this does is leave you totally unprepared for the game's multitude of cosmic horrors. The juxtaposition of sunny demeanor and existential doom work together to create an immensely powerful sense of dread. See, the longer the note, the more dread. We also quickly learn there's going to be absolutely no markers or instructions telling you where to go or what to do, and it's so fucking refreshing. I am absolutely sick of being told exactly what to do all the time in every game I play. Pick up your hat. I don't need to be told this. I'm not a child. Look, I can pick up a hat any day of the week. I don't need to. Oh, fuck. Early on, one of your friends tells you there's a water planet nearby, and it has a mysterious current that stops anyone from getting to its center. Do you think we need a quest marker to tell us to get to the center of Giant's Deep? No, it's become our new life goal. It's somehow top stop the sun from exploding, but let's face it, it isn't quite as crucial as pick up hat. All right, I've got you this time. Ah! I just had my wisdom teeth pulled and nothing hurts more than screaming. I hope someone found that funny. The driving force of this story is to find logs left by an ancient advanced race known as the Nomai, who used to live in this solar system. And it's clear these logs probably hold the secret to learning what is causing the sun to explode and the time loop we're currently stuck in. Now we leave our planet and we very quickly run into some tissues issues. <gasps>
About half of this game is spent on just two of the many planets in this solar system. One of these two is Brittle Hollow. This planet has a volcanic moon spraying the surface with fiery rocks. It's slowly breaking up and collapsing into itself, and at its center is a black hole that teleports any falling objects to a distant white hole out in space. And while this is all amazing to discover and learn about, it makes exploring Brittle Hollow an absolute nightmare. You only explore this enormous planet from below the surface. So if you slip up even once while exploring, you're invariably pulled into the giant black hole hole below and teleported to the complete other side of the solar system. And from here it takes at least three or four minutes just to get back. And there are so many situations where you're at risk of this happening. You have to traverse upside down paths, vertical paths, jump between vertical walls trying to stick landings while the screen rotates, and if you mess up even one of these jumps, it's into the black hole with you. Yeah. Here I am getting ready to travel from one tractor beam to another, and I think you can sense my terrified panic that I'm gonna miss and have to start this whole area all over again. Oh god, please! <sighs> miss a jump, run out of fuel, run out of oxygen, be on a platform that starts collapsing randomly without warning, and it's back to the outskirts of the solar system for you. It looks like I've turned into a farmer now. Yeah. And remember, the sun is still exploding every 20 minutes, which also sends you all the way back to your home planet. With all this in mind, I'd say the average person will need to voyage to and explore Brittle Hollow at least five or six times just to see it all. But up is not jump, I hear you say. That's only one planet. And to that I say, don't call me up is not jump. There's also the Hourglass Twins, which are two orbiting planets. Ember Twin is a huge series of intertwining cave systems, while Ash Twin is a big ball of sand. At the start of each time loop, Ash Twin starts transferring its sand to Ember Twin. This fills it up and alters both of the planet's landscapes over time. Now again, all of this is fucking genius, and it's all programmed perfectly. But do you know what makes exploring a huge network of intertwining caves not enjoyable? Is it the whole planet looking identical? Is it the looming sun ready to go supernova at any moment? Or is it the the entire cave network filling up with sand quickly blocking off all the areas you really need to get to. There's even a puzzle where you need to travel to Brittle Hollow, traverse the underside, activate a switch, get back to the surface, leave the planet, travel to Ash Twin, land on it, wait for enough sand to leave the planet, find a teleporter and get teleported back to Brittle Hollow. And when you finally do all of this, and I'm not fucking joking, if you press jump, this button here, you disconnect from the surface of Brittle Hollow and immediately fall into the black hole, teleporting you to the other side of the solar system. I'll send you through a fucking black hole. There, we never have to think about that plan. Ow! <laughs> the other half of this game, however, is genuinely some of the best shit I've ever seen in my life. Wait, better shit than this? I'd like to see them try. Dark Bramble is covered in interdimensional portals that warp space-time and is filled with giant screaming anglerfish of death. There's a moon that exhibits quantum behavior on a macro scale, so every time you stop observing it, it disappears and eventually starts orbiting a different planet. There's a giant ocean planet filled with electrified glowing jellyfish. Oh no, wait, let's go back to that moon again. In 1803, Thomas Young dramatically informed the Royal Society of London that he had invented an experiment that proved if you simply observe an electron, it can change its behavior on a quantum level. Now this disproved quite a few things one of which being Newton's theory of particles. Ah, oh, that Newton, he's so smug. All he did was discover gravity. Gravity! Is gravity really that hard to discover? I mean, it's everywhere. Watch. Uh, right. Here. See? Wait a minute, is that Paul still? Oh, for God's sake. Young realized if you fire a beam of electrons at two slits, you get this pattern on the other side of the slits. These brighter bands here represent areas where most of the electrons are ending up, and so act a little bit like a probability function. Nespa? An electron coming out of the emitter here is most likely to end up in any of these places, though we can't say at all which one for certain. But if you were to place an electron detector here at one of the slits, you can observe an electron going through. And terrifyingly enough, as soon as we observe an electron here, our probability probability pattern collapses into two single bands. This electron now definitely goes here. And any electrons now going through here definitely end up here. By simply observing one electron, we've completely changed its behavior. Now I know what you're thinking. Does this make me a god? Yes. This is a lot like the quantum moon in this game. You see, the moon actually has an equal probability of orbiting any of the planets in this solar system. But as soon as we observe it, its probability locks in to 100%, and that's where it is. Until, of course, we stop observing it. Now tell me, do we want to land on that moon? You bet your ass we do! Data? Yes, Captain. Set course for that moon. Data, what's happened to you? I don't know what you mean, Captain. 
Okay, well, set course for that moon. Well, Captain, this appears to be impossible. You see, the moon possesses a quantum fluctuation distortion that actually masks local visual fields. This will result in a multifaceted <sighs> displacement phenomenon. Anyway, as you progress through the game, you learn the Nomai actually traveled to our solar system while looking for something called the Eye of the Universe. Now, apparently this eye is giving off a signal that is somehow older than the universe itself. This implies that the eye is an object or entity that existed before the Big Bang, before time itself. It may even represent what some of us would call a god. Now tell me, do you want to find this eye? You bet your ass we do! Data? Yes, Captain? Set course for the eye of the universe. Oh god, I keep forgetting you look like that. I don't know what you're getting at, sir. Okay, it's, it's fine. Set course for the eye of the universe. Captain, this too seems impossible. The eye of the universe is actually in a state of continuous quantum flux, analogous to this system's quantum moon. This means posing <sighs> triangulation and display Maybe one day. this phenomenon. So to help them find the eye of the universe, the Nomai invented black hole warp technology, which we are all too familiar with. Discovered time travel, invented the ability to store memories in statues, built a device that if powered by an exploding sun, it could send a person's memories back in time by 20 minutes, invented a space station that could blow up a sun, but it didn't work, and shortly after they were all horribly killed by an unrelated exploding space asteroid. Yes. Wait, wait, doesn't all that explain everything that's happening to you in the game? Well, basically. Basically. The Nomai realized that finding the eye of the universe was going to be so difficult, the only way to give them enough time to do it was to utilize time travel that was so energy intensive it needed to be powered by an exploding sun. The real genius of this story, though, is what dawns on you over the course of the game as you uncover it. It comes to you slowly at first, but by the end, you got it. There isn't any way to stop your sun exploding or to save your friends. The Nomai failed when they tried to blow up your sun. It's just so much time has passed since then, your sun has simply finished its life life and is dying by its own accord. And when it does, it just triggers this centuries-old technology that sends your memories back in time. And there's a lot of clues around you to back that up. See, if you look up at any point in this game, you'll see a flash of light. This is a distant star going supernova, or exploding. Here on Earth, we observe in the sky about a couple hundred of these each year. Yet in this game, there's one every few seconds, or, or more than that. The Outer Worlds is actually set in a time billions of years from now, where the universe is basically out of time. The stars themselves have all lived out their lives and are dying. The thing that's killed you, your friends, your home, it's just the inevitable expulsion of all energy and life in the universe. Oh, this chocolate is delicious. What brand is this? <laughs> and no matter how hard you accidentally keep colliding with Brittle Hollow, fuck, it ain't gonna change that. Once you realize everyone you know is totally fucked, you can either relive the same 20 minutes over and over again for the rest of time, which to be honest doesn't feel far off what I'm doing with my marriage, or you can try and track down the eye of the universe. If you do this, eventually you'll find its exact coordinates, and later on in the terrifying depths of Dark Bramble, you'll find a Nomai ship capable of warping you there. But this ship is missing its power source. Conveniently, you'll also learn that the machine that is sending your memories back in time is powered by such a source. So all we gotta do is remove it and take it to Dark Bramble. You see, here's where the game's final bombshell hits you. If you die while in this haven of safety and joy, you won't be taken back in time and revived. What's great about this is this is going to be the first time in this whole 20 hour experience where you're actually in any real danger. Once you remove this vital lifeline too, a piece of music immediately starts playing that is a remix of the music that plays just before the sun is about to explode. And as you can imagine, this creates an incredible sense of dread. Well, if I'm gonna die, I'm gonna do it in style. We eventually find and power up the Nomai ship and warp to the eye of the universe. We arrive just in time to look up and see our sun explode for the last time. Everyone we know is dead, but rather than... <laughs> And rather than feel sad, you feel some deep sense of acceptance. And I think it mostly comes down to how well the Herthian race has been characterized. All this time, the Herthians have seemed somewhat amused by the idea of their mortality, like it was a game all along. A good example of this is at the beginning of the game, a seed from Dark Bramble lands and takes root on your planet. This, as we've seen from the last planet this happened to, is the equivalent of discovering baby fucking Cthulhu on your doorstep and just cheerfully thinking nothing of it. My kids will love to see this. And what does he have to say about this seed? Hmm. Hmm, this is gonna be a chore to chop up. What, what? No! This is very bad! Have you even been to the place it came from? You can't help but think they'd be totally accepting of all of this and just be proud of you for making it all this way. Eventually you enter the eye of the universe and thus observe what it actually is. 
And from then on, the fucking spectacular ending of this game is open for interpretation. But I see it as this. The eye itself is a quantum object, just like the quantum moon, which is why they look similar. And now it's finally been observed by a conscious observer. This, like the collapsing probability spectrum we discussed earlier, locks the eye into a single state of existence. This in turn ends the current dying universe. A new singularity is created from the campfire. A big bang occurs and time begins anew. 14.3 billion years pass and we see that new planets are happily forming in this new universe, with new explorers ready to enjoy them. All in all really, this undoubtedly makes me God Almighty himself, Lord of all he commands, finally the recognition I deserve! Sometimes I voice record in the nude so that my clothes don't rustle. So there we have it. Overall then, I'd give this game a 9 out of 10. I don't really feel like there's much else to say, except maybe I should have spent this time defusing this bomb. I did have the time. Oh, I, I guess it's been deactivated. So there we have it! Overall then I'd give this game a 9 out of 10. I don't really feel like there's anything else left to say, except maybe I should have used all this time to defuse this bomb. Wait, haven't I already said all this before? Oh god, I'm stuck in a time- No, don't remember anything I'm done. I swear if I have to edit another frame. So here we are in my spaceship lounge area. And you know, it occurs to me as we hurtle through space. I don't know, it looks an awful lot like Earth out there. <laughs> no, two things. One, the Nomai were in dire need of better security. You're telling me a sliding ball opens your main base of operation. Well, no wonder you all died. And two, I can't watch any Netflix shows out here, can I? I mean, technically I'm in Thargoid space. And terrifying as they are, they just can't get a good sitcom right. What's that? Oh wait, no, sorry, that's my space phone. Or as we call them out here in space, a mobile. Did I steal that joke? Ah, uh, hello, clone of me! Hi, why don't you just use the VPN Surfshark? Ah, oh, another great idea from clone number 12711271111211. Surfshark is a VPN that lets you virtually place your phone, tablet, laptop or TV in any country. So no matter where you are, you can stream content from any country in the world in the world. So say I want to watch Shawshank Redemption here in the UK, or, or in space, using one of my streaming services. Well, I can't do it. But with one click, I can be surfing US content and bam. Also, a VPN like Surfshark makes your internet more secure by masking your IP address and makes you safer from hackers and trackers. I can see through time. Surfshark's not expensive either. They've made a special offer for you guys that watch me. If you use the link in the description box below and use code UPISNOTJUMP, you can get 83% off Surfshark, plus an extra three months for free. And now I'm going to utilize ball technology to close my airlock. Yes. Thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you next time.